Hi there. I'm Joe Dudek, president and founder of Keyhole Marketing. And I'm Shannon Jarek. I work for Keyhole as the assistant brand manager. And this is Metaphorically Speaking, a podcast that explores the mysterious side of marketing. Welcome to Metaphorically Speaking. This week, we had the absolute pleasure of sitting down and chatting with Jason Crampton from Lincoln Street Barbers in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, let's talk beards for a second. (laughs) I'm always ready to talk beards, as you can tell (laughs) in this this podcast for sure. It was great to sit down with another guy with equally impressive beard. I shouldn't say equally (laughs) more impressive beard uh, than mine, I would say even. so. Hard to Uh, do. It is hard to do, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely felt like I was invading on, you know, an intimate moment. As a beardless female, I was like, I just don't belong in this room. <laughs> we did mute it a few times just to kind of really <laughs> during some special moments, but it was still a good conversation. I think everybody can hopefully get some good stuff out of it. It was cool to just hear his story of how he saw a need in the industry. You know, he worked for years like in the salon game and saw some some gaps there, but saw how really the, the male had been unattended to in this in this world and just saw like I gotta create something for that for that absolutely setting. yeah and I loved how he just addressed like the personal relationship that a customer in their barber has you know you sit down in that chair and just start divulging personal information and you're like how how did this happen mm-hmm. and he kind of addresses just like the power of that relationship and even the power of physical touch in yeah. you know that half an hour that you're with them and so it's just really cool yeah now, now I'm like second guessing what I've told a massage therapist in the past. Oh, <laughs> this, <laughs> that's the secret to get to get me to open up is physical touch. Who knows? <laughs> sure. But um, I think even like towards the end of the conversation, we we sort of got into our own therapy session of just talking through how we're both trying to you know calm ourselves down with our new ideas and where we want to go with the business and sort of pumping the brakes and taking a moment to breathe in life. So uh, hopefully you'll enjoy that part as well. Not just business story and how we got his business going, but also just like, how are we trying to manage our lives a little bit? So hopefully you enjoy the conversation. I'm curious, when's the last time as a, as a barber, when's the last time you shaved your own face down to nothing? Oh man, that was actually, ooh, last, I want to say about a year and a half ago. Oh yeah. Yeah. It had been about six years. And, yeah. Uh, there was just a lot of change that happened. I just felt like I just kind of needed to cleanse it. Fresh start. And, yeah. yeah. Fresh start. So one of our newer barbers, uh, she goes by T-Rex. She <laughs> shaved it. Um, and for me, I had been thinking about it, but I had kind of just sprung it on her. Yeah. So I kind of scared the shit out of her, you know? Oh, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Nervous, you know, she just started and, uh, she was the first one that ever shaved my entire face. So yeah. That was the last time. I didn't tell my wife. <laughs> Went home, recorded the reaction. It was priceless. Oh, man. What was the reaction? Uh, she didn't know it was me. Oh, um, gosh. Yeah. So she just kind of looked at me. She thought it was one of the maintenance guys. Uh, at the time, we were in an apartment complex. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she just kind of was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Who and, are you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was priceless. And then my son, he hasn't seen me without a beard for like i said six years oh, so yeah. you know that's a lifetime for a young kid yeah so it was funny his reaction he kept watching me eat and was like, <laughs> yeah. you know, i've never seen your mouth move yeah dad, your ex- face move. exactly and he uh he was like dad you're uh you're always smiling now that your beard's gone <laughs> i'm like no dude i'm always smiling yeah you can't see it <laughs> <laughs> that is funny we did that i think for my wife's birthday gosh it's been it's maybe six years or longer ago, and it was like she had asked for it because I had always had some sort of facial hair since we've been married, and it's uh, um, ever since we've been married, and that'll be twenty years this year. But and it's been like some sort of like mutton chops, or then I went with like some Civil War like weird cut, you know, and right. like always had some sort of hair. And then she's like, just shave it down for nothing. And then like as soon as I showed her the results, she was like, oh my gosh grow that stuff back right away like she just wasn't comfortable with it because she's so used to seeing some form of hair on there and um yeah so i've never done it since then that was supposed to be part of my gift to her and i realized that was like the worst gift i could have ever given her (laughs) she was not happy oh man yeah i kind of feel like i got the same 
humble reaction. Was, so you gonna grow it back? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, how soon does that yeah. stuff grow back? I knew right away when I looked in the mirror, like, oh shit, I gotta grow this back. Man. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, so did I. I had like, and I like the last time I was, you know, in my twenties. I hadn't, you know, had some double chins or whatever. So you shave it off, like, oh shit, I didn't <laughs> put a little weight underneath there. Okay, right. and so there's some stuff you can hide with the beard that you can't when you don't have it on there. Absolutely. So I was like, and and also for me, just because of the blonder, reddish hair, like I look like I'm 12. So it's better to have a little bit of like, look a little older, a little bit more wiser, maybe. Get some uh, respect. Out it's there. right. People, <laughs> people don't keep pushing me aside. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> so yeah, let's get started. Um, you you grew up around here, right? You're from, I did. Yeah. yeah, you're the second person I've talked to, which is from Colorado Springs originally. And, I mean, that's that's mostly rare from my experience in talking to people. Since I'm not from here, I'm always asking people, you know, where would you, where, are you, where are you from? And nobody's from here. So it's kind of funny that the first two interviews I've done out here are people from here. So Yeah, you know two Sasquatches, man. Yeah, <laughs> kind exactly. Of, kind of the running joke is... Uh, you know, if there's a local around, it's it's super rare. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely, I've got some sort of, like, I don't know, special luck going on right now. I need to, like, play the lottery yeah, or something right, right now. We're doing. <laughs> um, so you grew up here. Um, brothers, sisters? Yeah, I have um, two brothers and a sister, older brother, um, and uh, two younger siblings. It's uh, my older brother, me, my sister, then my younger brother. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you kind of live true to the middle child, the birth order, personalities. Um, I think there's a special blend with us. You know, my younger two were from my dad's second marriage. Okay. So, yeah. You know, we didn't always grow up together and all that. So, I think a lot of us in the, in our dynamic dodged any, except my older brother. He, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He kind of stays true to form. For sure, yeah. yeah. He's the top of the top of the group. Yeah, we had kind of like a his, mine, and ours experience, too. My dad had four in his first marriage. My mom had two. And then my sister and I were from their marriage. So I definitely was the baby of everybody. But it was still like, it was hard to know who was a middle child. But because for most, some of their life, they were the older child. But now they're the middle child. And once every all families came together. So it was definitely this weird hodgepodge of, of people. You never could identify people yeah. based on their birth order. Totally. How many siblings do you say? Seven total. Um, four from my dad's first marriage, two from my mom's, and then f a full sibling. So, nice. um, so there's about a 25 year age gap, I think, between the oldest and myself. So, that always makes conversations interesting because right. you're you're never like really in the life, same life stage. You know, <laughs> you sort of catch up with adult, and that quickly passes because now they're thinking about you know retirement or they've got grandkids, and you're just like getting your life started. You feeling so? It was always like especially like family get-togethers was awkward because we were hard to find that bridge of conversation. Right. <laughs> Talk about your childhood a little bit, kind of paint a picture for what that looked like. Um, I think uh, for the most part, it was my older brother and I kind of hanging out together. We would spend time either um, at my dad's house in New Mexico um, or my mom's house here. Typically, we'd go to school here and then shoot out to New Mexico in the summertime, either mm -hmm. spend the time with my dad or... Uh, my uh, mom's mom had a fruit stand close to the Navajo reservation. Mm. So we'd uh, spend summers working out there, yeah. just running around, catching lizards and messing around with scorpions and stuff with, uh, you know, my cousins were usually there, my brother and. Yeah. So that was kind of pretty much it, man. That's um, in New Mexico, the Navajo reservation? Yeah, that okay. was in New Mexico, then here. Um, grew up down in Widefield. Um, okay. Stayed down there until I got a little bit older and started working and. Yeah moved out to Washington State for a little while but love it here man yeah Came back and it's home okay yeah what what was the divorce like on on music yeah like how old were you when that happened oh man I can't even remember I oh. was three so, oh so, super young yeah 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 kind of that it's almost like up. you didn't know a life before really no yeah no, yeah definitely it was kind of you know run of the mill for us yeah 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 same for me I mean by the time I came around my parents have stayed together but you know I didn't. I just sort of heard about it from my siblings, the, the drama. But um, how about school? Were you good in school? Were you? Ah, uh, I'm. I'm great at what I want to apply myself mm. to. I'd say. <laughs> um, it, yeah, man. I was. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I was good socially in school. Yeah, um, yeah. When I apply myself, you know, junior high, I really tried to make honor roll. Did that. Yeah. Um, but ultimately. You know, started just 
hanging out with the you know i wouldn't say wrong crowd because we're all friends <laughs> <laughs> so we just uh we were left to our own vices you yeah. know and, and got in a lot of trouble and and learned things uh differently down in widefield that wasn't maybe typical upbringing but mm-hmm. you know here we are i did all right and yeah thank, thank god <laughs> yeah it's always interesting just talking entrepreneurs because they're kind of all over the board with school and you know you get some people who are super serious and they always had this drive to be a business owner and then you've got sort of i'm kind of in the same boat as you where i probably could have been a lot better student had i actually like put the time and energy in but I did okay with grades, um, never great, but I, you know, I think I, I could have done better. But you get some of those who are like they had different skills that, that didn't sit well in the classroom or in the in the seat. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they they get better applied as a, as a business owner because you can create your own space, make that work for yourself versus like the way school was set up for all us to like fit in this mold. You know? Yeah, I think traditional school wasn't uh, for me at at the age yeah now i understand and can read a book and apply the learning concepts (laughs) exactly back then you know just give me something hands on yeah 100 percent agree with that when you were a kid without jumping too far away and too far down the story but um did you see yourself as a business owner like as an adult did that ever cross your mind you know what's funny uh i I never actually implanted it in my head i want to own a business i think i always kind of did things my own way um, I do remember I had a cousin and we always played office okay, <laughs> you know? yeah. so it's kind of funny like when I think of that now it's like oh maybe you know it was like this cool dream but it was never yeah. like yeah I'm, I want to be this entrepreneur anything like that yeah um, no. did you have any entrepreneurial influences growing up like aunt or you know yeah yeah I think my grandma running the fruit stand yeah definitely yeah. you know or I gotta see you know her run everything and and get cash in hand Mm, and yeah something about that you know kind of drove me is like she her hard work is getting rewarded instantly yeah you know so i think it was always kind of something embedded in lodged away for later yeah Yeah, that's that's cool so you graduated high school um correct no. no, you didn't graduate <laughs> high school. I was I, actually thought about that. I was like, I, maybe you... I I did not graduate okay. high school. Um, you know, I I my mom, she was a single mom, did the best she could, but again, we were kind of left to our own and yeah. uh Widefield's unique, you know. We mm. um we learned a lot of entrepreneur skills outside of school yeah. and that was kind of uh, I was more into that. Um Yeah. So it got to a point where um you know, it was just kind of me to make my own decisions um, around that time, and you know, I was I was making money outside of school. It was making more sense to me, um, so I just kind of called it. I just kind of I don't want to say quit. I moved on. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Never came back. Never went back. Never started. No, job you know, I got my GED okay, just yeah. to make sure, like, you know, get a job at least have that. Yep. And, yep. So then, what after maybe GED? What What was the next step after that? Um, I was already working in restaurants as a cook. Okay. Um, love that. I met some uh, guys there, man. Uh, some mentors. They kind of took me under the their wing. Mm-hmm. Uh, great guys, but again, they uh, different entrepreneur uh, <laughs> road. We were we were down. So, man, we were just getting a lot of you know trouble. Um, kind of working as cooks, kind of working doing other stuff mm-hmm. uh, making money um and did that for a while until yeah it's time to start growing up yeah and, uh cooking was man i loved it but yeah. i was like hey, i can't be a line cook forever and was there some moment in time where you're like yeah i just can't something did something happen or just sort of like you just reach an age when you realize i think there's just an age and then you know certain people get in trouble or uh Mm -hmm. you know things don't always go well and you you start looking at at where you're going and i got a phone call from my older brother one time and that kind of set me straight um so yeah i kind of look like okay you know i i love being a line cook it's so fun Mm -hmm. i love the hands-on stuff but i gotta put some big boy pants on yeah yeah were there things when you were when you were working at the I know it's a different industry than what you landed in but were there some things that you were like sort of lodging away in your mind for 
how to run a business, how to manage staff. What were, were there some things you sort of taking from that from a business ownership standpoint? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, and again, I still wasn't thinking of owning my own right. place. I was, I was just like, God, I actually went and got the most boring office job at an RV dealership. Um, <laughs> Cause I was just like, I just gotta go get it like a big boy job yeah, yeah exactly. put a button up on you know? yeah <laughs> um, so it was boring but i loved it i i learned a lot i grew a lot in character there um and i learned how shitty that was for me and i never wanted to go back mm -hmm. um so i thought like dude i gotta do something hands-on fast paced i'm used to making money uh, the harder i work the more i make yeah so um, I just kind of was like, man, I got to go back to being a line cook so I can be happy one at, at my work mm -hmm. and just kind of get back to, you know, charging my spirit and, and figure it out from there. So, yeah. How did you get from line cook to the hair the care hair, industry? Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, it's funny, kind of backing up to my childhood. Yeah. Um, it was definitely always ingrained in me. I always loved it. Um, barber shops, being around them the first time. My brother and I got yelled at was by a barber in a barber shop. Oh, okay. We were goofing around in a shopping center, running around, opening the doors, screaming in the doors. Um, we went to do it a second time at the barber shop, and, and the barber called us in into the the shop, and yeah. uh, he he kind of had this way of reprimanding us, but not humiliating us. And and every other guy was in there, and they were just kind of giving us this good advice of why not to act a fool you know mm -hmm. so yeah i just got captivated then then um you know fast forward um i'm back working as a line cook and um one of my friends was going to school for hair and she was like you should do it and mm. get into it and at the time uh my friends um parents actually owned a school here and they were in it okay. so they kept telling her tell jason he's got to get into it mm. So was, what, what were some of the reasons? Do you remember why? Like, why they did they think you had something special for that game, or, or I think they just they, enjoyed so much? Or? Yeah, I think they enjoyed it so much. Uh, we all grew up together, okay. and I think yeah, they definitely knew. Yeah, you know, I can look at someone and be like, "You're a barber man." Oh, like, really? Yeah, I think you just know like okay. yeah, this would be your jam, you know. So I I think they saw that in me, but it, they were hairstylists. Yeah. So I told them I was like, "No, nah, I want to be a barber man." Um, what are some of those characteristics that you say like stand out to you about being a? Uh, the difference yeah like when you say you can identify somebody who can be a barber like what are some of the characteristics you see in them um I think just when they're talking about getting into the industry okay they're saying the right things gotcha. and and how their energy is mm. you know it's just it's right there yeah you know, there's a friend of mine in school right now and he would sit in my chair and talk about it and even before he approached me about it, I knew, like, this guy's going to go to barber school. Yeah. Because he yeah. was talking about, like, why do you do that there? What do you do here? Mm -hmm. So he asked me, and I was like, all right, it's about time, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I just think um, knowing your industry and knowing when someone's talking about it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's kind of what frees that up. No, that's cool. That's cool. Um, so they were talking to you about getting into that game, and then you totally so finally jumped on board with that. I did. I went and... Uh, went and uh, got my hairstyling license and was doing mainly women's hair for years. Okay. And uh, always was with the thought of like, I'm gonna get a barber shop when I'm closer to retiring, you know, cause back then they were like, uh, go where the money's at, you know, women's hair is where the money's at. And this is like what time, what year? Ooh, 95? Okay. Yeah, okay. no, I'm sorry, 2005. 2005, 2005. okay. 2005, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I went that route and kind of my thought was do women's hair until I got closer to retiring then open a barber shop. Yeah. But um, as time went on, I just got more guys in my chair and enjoy that side of things more and more. Mm -hmm. In the stylist game, though, still not not like the not in the barbering world, still in the stylist game. Not in not in the barbering world. Um, I I, you know, I'm always growing. I'm always learning. So I always yeah. consider myself like a student in anything I do. Mm. But the barbering game, I was like, I'm never going to call myself a barber no matter how good I get at cutting hair unless mm. I go get my barber's license yeah that's a huge integrity thing in that culture and I wanted to respect that yeah that's awesome yeah so I went back and got my license yeah yeah were you hooked hooked on hair I don't know if that's a, were, you, were you hooked on hair like right away um 
Like, was it, did you just like, yeah, I finally found my, my jam or was it, did it, did it take a while for you to kind of get into it? It took a while, man. I was, yeah. I was terrified to cut hair. Mm. You know, I've never brushed a woman's hair and yeah. I'm trying to cut it. You know? Yeah, and for I, sure. I've definitely apologized to anyone's hair. I have jacked up in the past <laughs> when I was learning. Um, but I just kept at it, man. Anything I was like intimidated about it, I just worked on it and worked on it because mm-hmm. I wanted to know that and be able to nail it. Yeah, yeah. I've gotten some bad haircuts over the years, and it is that does feel like a lot of pressure on you. I mean, you know, everybody, everybody's different. Everybody has their own taste that they're maybe conveying to you well enough for you to get like what's what's the vision, and then you get that get that one time, man. You can't you can't fix it. A lot yeah. of times you yeah. just well, yeah. you did what you did. Um, were there some things while you were in that phase of life where you were, again, not yet a barber, hadn't gone to school yet, um, where you were seeing some things, again, kind of lodging some stuff away, like, this this seems broken in this industry. There's some things I would love to fix. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, at the time I was in a salon. Um, so, you know, guys would come in, and it was typically uh, no one would want to cut their hair, and hmm. no one kind of at that time gave a shit about how the guy's hair was gonna look. Mm. And the stereotype was, or the, you know, the kind of, I guess, stereotype was guys don't care enough about their hair. Yeah. yeah. You know, for me, it bugged me. I'm like, what? I'm a guy I care about. Yeah, hair. for sure. Like, what are you yeah. talking about? So I kind of took that on as like, and I wanted, you know, make sure I do a good job for guys because every time they'd sit in my chair, yeah. they were frustrated. You know, no one listens, yeah. no one gets what I'm on. Yeah. So you're sort of just a, a waiting stop until they get to the, the real client they want to take you know, pay attention exactly, to. Yeah. Exactly. Totally. Kind of a filler. Yeah. Um and then culturally I noticed like guys are kind of we're missing that dwelling place. You mm-hmm. know, that kind of place to hang out. Yeah. Those old traditional barber shops. Um we're kind of fizzling out and mm-hmm. I didn't grow up with them, you know, kind of missed them. Yeah. Um, so I kind of noticed in our generation, younger guys, we were missing that camaraderie and that yeah. just communication with guys mm-hmm. and goofing around and yeah. uh, a place kind of where we could uh, throw our hats off and be ourselves. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Um, so you started, you went to barber school. How, how long does that take? What's a, um, I think it was, I already had my license, okay. so those hours transferred. Gotcha. Um, so for me, I went for three months and then had to take a state board test. Okay. So, that, so. so then what did you do with that? Did you take those skills back to the salon you were working at, or did you did you have to, not, were you not able to put those to work until another gig? No, so what I did was I was already kind of filling my books with, um, male clients okay so when i went to the school um i'd work at the salon during the day and then at night when i was at school i would just have clients go there Mm -hmm. and work on them there gotcha so my transition was i would just pick a day where i only focused on guy clients Mm -hmm. and i'd ask the front desk just book guys you know okay to with the owners all that yeah and um kind of slowly started building um kind of my barbershop idea with the clients I had while I was going to school mm. um, had a little corner in the sh- in the salon that it was just you know kind of I designed it and all that oh, so cool. it was a little more masculine feel yeah. um, guys would come in run over hide we called it the corner of real because um, <laughs> awesome. we could just go be ourselves you know there was um, one of my barbers Graham now uh, awesome guy he uh was actually working front desk there at the time. Mm. So we would all just goof around in that corner because he was super close to us. And that's where just our little tiny culture started and yeah. started growing. Yeah, that's awesome. I know there's even like massages, I'd get like a, a massage at a place and like some of those places, they've, they've certainly changed over the years, but initially it was like part of a salon. You had to like, it just wasn't like, you felt like you were in the wrong place, you know, or you had to just like duck in the back corner and go get your massage, but you walked by 45 chairs that you were the only man there. And it never, you never, you always felt like you were out of, out of place. Totally. And uh, I totally can respect that. Um, the the need that you saw in the industry, because it was just like, we, we always did feel like we're not only second, second, like not paid attention the uh, first, but at the same time, we're, we don't necessarily belong here, you know, in some respects. Right. And, um, so then when you, like, at what point, like, kind of what happened, I'm talking about some of those things that happened that just said, okay, I've been doing this, I've been doing this in this shop, but when do I start my own thing? Yeah, um, 
honestly, it was, uh, I was going to school and um, one of my buddies, we'd always talk about it. Uh, Gray Archpreneur is a super awesome guy. Um, he, I wasn't really thinking of opening my own shop at the time. Mm. You know, I was just like, ah, oh, I just want to go work in this place. And this place didn't exist. So he asked like, where are you going to go work? Where is mm -hmm. this place? And he was kind of nudging me like, you got creative. You know? <laughs> so that's what we started doing, man. We started sitting down once a week and he helped me out and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Did he, was he a part of the business or just kind of helping you get uh, some ideas together? Nah, he was just a great guy yeah. getting some ideas together. Um, I had met him years ago when I was apprenticing under a oh, hairstylist. Okay. She was cutting his hair and um, I always dug this dude, you know, mm -hmm. he was super nice, like well-spoken, smart as shit. Yeah. Um, and killing it in life, but his humbleness is what really gravitated me towards him. Like, mm -hmm. man, he's so humble, but has but it. Successful, you know? yeah, yeah, Exactly, yeah. so um, years down the road, this guy, this lady moved on, he comes into the, the salon and gets his hair cut by another girl, and we start chatting, then he starts coming to me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we just started planning it. Um, and his his deal was I'll I'll help you with the business plan if I'm the first guy in line to invest. Mm. So I'm like shit, hell yeah, man! <laughs> For sure, bigger yeah, dollars. Throw money at me and <laughs> and help me with this. Exactly. You know? So uh, he was he's a blessing, man. He's still a great dude, mm. uh, great mentor. Um, what it ended up happening was we got to the end of the road and I didn't need investors. Oh <laughs> yeah, okay. So we had to have that talk, and yeah. he's like, you're right, you know, hit me up if you ever need anything bigger. And That's awesome. It's not so. like you didn't have to have, like, an awkward conversation. He was, like, supportive of wherever yeah, you were. Yeah, so supportive, man. I, I can't thank that dude enough. That's for awesome. Sure. Yeah. So when you were dreaming this thing up, like, what were – I don't know. I, came, I was thinking about, like, um, when I was a kid, I used to go to this barber shop, and um, it was in this basement of this guy's house, and he had the barber pole outside, and it was – a guy who was served in the Navy, I want to say World War II, and just cut traditional haircuts. But, you know, what was so fun about that going with there with my dad was just, like, the conversations and some of these guys had been there for hours before we got there. Like, I'm sure their cuts were already done if they even got a haircut, but they are just hanging out. So those are that's what I think about when I think about, like, barbershop experience. What were some of the things you were thinking about, like, I've got to integrate this into that? Like, this, to me, is a barbershop experience. What were some of those things? Yeah, I think... Um, uh, First and foremost, um, it was quality of haircuts and quality of experience mm. and and quality of gentleman interaction between two guys. Okay. You know, like I feel like that was kind of dead in the, the barber realm. You know, you kind of get this ego and all that. And I was like, nah, man, like I just want to create a cool place where everyone's cool and accepted. Mm. Um, and we do great work, you know. Yeah. But we're always educating ourselves. And... Um, culture was just as important you yeah. know those conversations those <laughs> yeah that kind of banter that you know where everyone it's a barber shop a, a, that has their culture down in my opinion is just the ultimate community because mm -hmm. everyone kind of leaves what they are in society at the door and and comes in and it's just yourself yeah you know so how did you foster that did that just sort of are there some intentional things you try to work in to create that culture in there in that community, or was it or was it more taking stuff out of what existed before to make it to make that stuff possible? Man, I don't think it was any of that. I think it was just authenticity. Mm. Um, I like people. I yeah. like I like people, man. I like hanging out with people. I like having a good time. Um, so it wasn't. It, there was this passionate need for the community not like create this for a business yeah you know yeah. so it was um just it, coming out of who you really were yeah yeah and that's who we are today yeah. you know like who we are is who we are yeah so, and we try to stay true to that and authentic to it as possible yeah sure. how do you find the right kind of talent you know i think you call them misfits yeah civilized place. misfits yeah so how do you um sort of Make sure you find the right ones to fit into that that community that you're trying to create. Totally. Or not create, but just offer, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm still learning. Um, I've gotten extremely lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, definitely have, have not made the right calls all the time. That's yeah. going to happen. You know, I opened a business three years ago, yeah. four years ago. I'm not. I'm a white belt, man. I'm not. Mm -hmm. 
sitting here and trying to write books about leadership and shit. You yeah. know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm learning. Um, but I got extremely, extremely lucky. The people I did see it in them and, and are with us today uh, understand the vision and, and, and trust me. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing is we all trust each other. Mm-hmm. You know? um, so I got lucky. My, my the first guy that came with me was Graham. Um, mm-hmm. super awesome guy. He was going to cosmetology school and I started barber school. Yeah. He was my first straight shave. Um, mm-hmm. I love him. I shaved his face into a creepy like herb stash. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> that was the first time we met and it was funny. I told him, I'm like, you're a barber. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me like, what does this guy even mean? Yeah. So a year down the road, he starts working at the salon I was at. Mm-hmm. So we just hit it off and, um, you know, there was just some things I I think he could have been treated better there as far as uh, educating and, and getting him his full potential in him that mm-hmm. I saw. So I felt bad because he kind of got this job there, and I'm like, I want to steal this dude and tell him to go to barber school, you know. Yeah. Um, so he was my first guy. I talked to him. At first he's like, nah, man, I'm putting my, you know, kind of gave a lot into this place. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't the happiest environment. So soon enough, his wife actually told him, thank God, bless her. <laughs> She's awesome. Um, told him, like, dude, you got go to barber school. Like, the only time you're happy about talking about your industry is when you're talking about what Jason's doing. Mm. Um, so he went to school. We were opening the shop. We were helping each other build it out. Yeah. Um, I was teaching him how to cut hair in my backyard, mm-hmm. um, getting him ready to go. That's awesome. So him and then um, after that, we got to a point where, you know, we had a few people come and go. Uh, we got to a point where we got Jay, our front desk guy, who's now our manager. Mm-hmm. Um, super awesome. Great help. Um, my wife, she's co-owner. Yeah. She was there learning front desk. We all didn't know what we were doing, you know. Mm-hmm. It just took off. Um then uh, after that, man, we got a Brandy in. She's super awesome, and uh, she was a veteran barber. Has been had tons of experience, yeah. so um, she had been in enough uh, shit show places <laughs> to where she dug what we were throwing down, and yeah. uh, has been with us ever since. And then um, we got a few other barbers that just blessed us with referring their friends there, mm-hmm. and they were in kind of some not so hot environments. Yeah. So. Yeah. Man, we're all just blessed to be there and happy and yeah. loving it. Yeah, that's great. Do you think you talked about some of the shit shows that people have worked in before? Have you think you've wor- kind of fixed some of those uh, issues at your shop? You still kind of work in it, still in evolution, or do you feel like you've created an environment that resolves some of that stuff in the past? I think we we created a, an environment and we're we're really refining it now. You know, um, for me to sit here and say I don't need any leadership training or something again, I'd be mm-hmm. totally egotistical. So I'm doing my part to help the team. Mm-hmm. Teams, we're always educating and helping each other out. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's still just continuing to, to evolve, yeah. Well, and you'll, you'll have your own issues, right? I mean, you're trying to fix stuff from the past, but you'll have your own issues that are unique to your place that you'll have to continue to Yeah, and I address. think that's it. And I think we have a strong crew that, again, we have great communication. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm big on accountability, and I, I can't emphasize being authentic enough. And, and I think they see that, and we all learn that and appreciate each other and mm. let each other make mistakes and grow from it. Yeah. Uh, so it really does we've been in enough drama that everyone they're all at that shop right now protecting it because Mm -hmm. it's their baby too yeah that's awesome yeah yeah that's i think really unique to get them to be in some sense part ownership you know and uh, whether that's actual equity in the business or if it's just the the feeling of this is mine i Mm -hmm. can i can create this thing and be part of its growth you know absolutely um how would you describe your managerial style? And you've kind of sat in there, you've stood at their stations, you know, done your own your own game. Like, how do you? What are some things you try to like bring to to the business as far as leading that crew? Um, I think most importantly is uh, being in the trenches with them. You know, mm-hmm. I cut hair with them. I'm there with them. They know if I'm not there, I'm putting in work. Mm-hmm. If they're working, um, so. What I'm always curious about with salons, but even, I mean, definitely barbershops too, is just like this therapist feel that you get sometimes when you're, <laughs> there's something about like getting your, your haircut that just makes you open up in some ways. You develop that relationship with the barber, or the stylist, whatever it may be. 
And um, I don't know, what, what do you think it is about that environment where people just feel comfortable to share to, to this person who you've only seen maybe once a month or once every couple months and, and you're only there for 35 minutes, but there's some sort of conversation that goes deeper than other people you've known for a long time. Totally, totally. Yeah. Um, honestly, uh, I, I don't have a deep answer for that. Mm-hmm. I read something years ago, it was a study, and the conclusion of the study was they thought it was because of the fact there's physical touch. Oh, wow. So we typically know more than therapists know, mm-hmm. more than, you know, a lot of people know because of that physical touch. Wow, That yeah. trust, um, I would assume if you have a razor to someone's throat, <laughs> make it through that, there's a trust there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. That is awesome. Yeah, I've always found that interesting. Do you feel like maybe a heavy sense of responsibility with some of the stuff that you, you take on, some of the things you hear, or... I don't know. Um, man, I think uh, eh, there's a boundary there. Mm-hmm. You know, there's you don't want to be inhuman to people, but you gotta you gotta be protective of your own energy. You yeah. Know, you have a bunch of you know people have a bad day and you're taking all that energy on. You gotta either do something to uh, reverse that mm-hmm. or block it during the process, or just have good boundaries so you're still having compassion for that person, yeah. but. You're not draining or jumping in their pit. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Also, I think uh, staying true to who you are mm-hmm. is going to gravitate that clientele to you. Mm-hmm. So even if your clientele has a bad day, it's not, you know, my guys have a bad day. It's like, oh, shit, this happened. Like, oh, man, that sucks. You mm-hmm. know, whereas if I was taking on every drama queen that ever sat in my chair and tried to save them, you know, yeah. as clients, I'd be a very drained human. For sure. So I think just being who I am and being true to that, and I preach that to barbers, man. Like, mm. you guys are all cool. Just be yourself. Like, if someone needs that person, they need to drain someone. Don't mm-hmm. don't fight for them to be your client. Yeah. You know, don't be a dick. But mm-hmm. they'll move on and find that person, and you'll get someone that fits your personality in that chair. Yeah. So, is that when you kind of think about like I guess I've to simplify it, I see like two major skill sets there. You've got the actual artistry of cutting hair and then you have the conversational artistry. Like how, how does that break out percentage wise when you're trying to hire? Is it you want them to be a people first people person more to kind of work within your culture or well, that will come but as long as they're great at their, their craft? Yeah, I think um, it's people person, it's, it's kind of different. Um, you know, we have some barbers that are amazing and they're just kind of quiet um i think the biggest thing that makes our staff comfortable is follow the person's energy you know like if you have a client coming in first thing in the morning and they're not saying anything and Mm -hmm. it's just one uh word answers they're giving you it's okay to chill and and just be present with each other and not say a word yeah you guys are both tired Mm -hmm. we can you know it's okay um if you do have that person that's talkative and all that, you know, yeah, I feel it's our job to step it up and have that conversation because that's what your client wants with their time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how we judge it as we do it, you know, per client. I don't tell everybody to come in and be me, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm super hyper. I actually calm myself down in the shop. You mm-hmm. know, I make sure like I'm an early riser. We get there at six. I'll be off the freaking walls, but yeah. I respect my more slow risers and, so I think it's just that understanding community. You know, I got one barber, my man, he's super quiet. He doesn't say much. He's super booked, but it's who mm-hmm. he is. He's not a dick. He's direct, yeah. amazing, and his clientele want that direct yeah. precision even in their conversation. Mm-hmm. So it works. You yeah. know, if he was, like, making people mad and offending people, we got to talk and, mm-hmm. like, adjust that. But Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah. So there isn't, like, one particular style you're trying to hire. It's really, like, that blend because – a certain person will work with this clientele and Absolutely. they'll all be served well with the end result, but they're, they're finding what they need. Um, they got yeah. yeah. And they got to understand the teamwork, the mm-hmm. accountability, the humbleness. Um, so it, you know, if all that's in play, a willingness to learn together. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're not so. How do you, do you have to, so I've got a good friend who's uh, just started his own salon, worked for years in it. He, I would say, even though I'm not in, in the industry, he was one of those guys who, I think he was in going to law school. Then he just went into this uh, hair care game. His wife was in there before. And um, once I got in there, it was like, oh, yeah, you should have been in this a long time ago. Like we, I, Even I saw like this is a skill set for years. And then, of course, it led him eventually into starting his own, his own place. But 
um he always talked about some of the drama that was always sort of around him, you know, at that salon and, and not just the clientele, but the staff. I mean, is that something like, how do you sort of keep that at bay? Uh, is, that, is that intentional or are you just, it's again, just the hires that you bring in there who are just the right fit for that and you don't have to deal with it at the end of the day? Yeah, I think um, uh, getting fortunate with the right hires mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then um, kind of that accountability across the board, yeah. you know, and I think it's a delicate accountability. You know, that's something I'm learning, kind of, you know, um, everybody has bad days, letting people vent and, and yeah. get back on track, you know, or be human. Um, hmm. But we're all cool, man. If we have someone that, you know, like get going down that road, it's, we haven't had an issue between staff yet. Hmm. You know, we're, we're great communicators. Um, everybody is okay with accountability. Yeah. We have a checklist. I'm the worst at marking it off at the end of our shifts to make sure we clean. You know, I do my part and clean. I always forget one freaking thing. My staff knows that, you know, but I'm accountable. You know, yeah, they come tell right. me, bro, that's out there. I go get it. I will walk out into the parking lot. And if I haven't marked off my sheet, you know, the staff will call, bro, you haven't marked it off, mm -hmm. you know? So I think just that. Just that respect. And respect. The, the, the safety that you can come to you right and like yeah. you've created that like you're not going to rip their head off or calling you out on your stuff totally and again i'm not perfect man yeah i, I started from plays with ripping heads off I yeah did, you know i'm learning um <laughs> but yeah again we know and again everyone walks with grace with everyone no that's awesome so that's awesome well i'm sure that yeah like i said that lead that comes from you you've created that and yeah you've screwed up but the, the ability for you to take ownership of that kind of stuff and, and move forward people are like I just think about it from a parenting style, like for me to apologize to my son, like he he knows it's safe to, to make mistakes, you know what I mean? Right. And to, to confess that versus like, dad's always right, I'm always wrong. Like I don't want him to get that vibe and, and same oh, kind of deal with you. Like, yeah, you screw up too and that's cool. Yep. And we're all in this together. Absolutely. You talked about your wife co-owning the business. How's that, how's that work for you guys? Is that, um, I don't know, I guess I look, I'm asking for a friend maybe because I no, just like a working relationship. Like how does that, does it work well? Is it a challenge? How do you sort of maintain balance between life and, and work or, totally. or create some separation there maybe? Absolutely. Um, again, all learning. Um, mm -hmm. It really wasn't the plan when we opened it. Um, my wife's a yoga therapist, so mm. that was uh, her path. The shop took off and uh, you know I was like, I need help. Um, <laughs> yeah. So thankfully she jumped on board and again, we learned all this together and we were day-to-day -day operations for a long time together and that took its toll mm. um so my wife knew this from the beginning um naturally i'm uh hard-headed <laughs> and uh you know kind of like no it's gonna be fine didn't go well like she knew you know mm -hmm. it's just gonna be too much for our relationship so we backed off and um we've really worked towards separating that now mm. um so it's great now we uh as far as day-to-day -day operations, it's mainly my manager, Jay, and I okay. that handle things. Uh, my wife, she, Julie, she um, handles things with our accountant, behind-the-scenes stuff. All that keeps the shop afloat. Um, so right now, that's kind of where it's at, and it's it's working good. It's freed her up to get back to her career. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of gave me my clubhouse back, you know, me and my manager can run things. Yeah. Uh, and uh, right now I feel like it's a good dynamic. Mm. You know, we check in every now and then as far as if there's anything else mm -hmm. she wants to delegate or let go of and yeah, just keep working that, so. she. I just always relish, you know, those, not relish, uh, envy, that's the word I was looking for. I always envy those who, uh, can make that work because I know my wife, she's worked for other businesses all her career and I've done my business for the last seven, almost eight years. And anytime we've crossed paths, or her, help me on this and can you, what's your thoughts on this? It always seems to end in like, I didn't want you to say that. I wanted you to say this or you're supposed to be okay with this this risk I wanted to do or, or something like that. And it's, it's always interesting to see like the relationships that work well in co-ownership or both people doing their own entrepreneurial thing because not that it's like we're, we're fighting or anything like that. We right. just have learned like maybe this isn't a safe space for us. We work better co co working on the on the marriage or, or parenting. But anything with the work, it sometimes gets a little bit more um, hard to hard to manage. Yeah, it does. I think um, we we've kind of learned and are continuing to learn our boundaries within that and found uh, a way to be great co owners together. Mm. Um, 
and still love each other and yeah. like each other at the end of the day. And, and my wife forces and, and thankfully makes us set that time aside because you know, mm. I'm that guy that just Keep on knows through. to the grindstone. Yeah. And so she's uh, thankfully there to make sure we slow down. Mm. And, you know, we life gets so busy. And the last thing you want to do is admit having to put a quality time with your wife on a calendar. But <sighs> right. you, you need to, you know, make yeah. sure it's present. And so. Thank I'm sure it helps to have her in that particular field where she's that's her role right she's trying to create space uh, physical space and she is yeah she's mental space, all yeah. about recharging those batteries yeah and, that's um, great it's good balance i'm sure yeah man who do you um who kind of helps keep you grounded so you know you're not you talked about some of those challenges you've learned over the years are there some people or some resources you've kind of leaned on over the years yeah man i think um i i'm very lucky to have the people that sit in my chair you know i think barbers are some of the smartest people in your community not because we went to some great school or you know but just because we have sat down with so many people and so many men of so many walks of life that have given us these pearls of wisdom that gave us a collection to have mm -hmm. knowledge um so i think a lot of it's just getting those 45 minute sessions mm -hmm. with guys if it's friends you know we get just talk as friends yeah if it's one of my mentors or a therapist sitting in my chair i'm damn good. i'm gonna pick his brain oh for sure <laughs> exactly um but yeah so i think just through the barber shop through you know my wife um everything she learns um open day hair and all that mm -hmm. it amazes me um so yeah i think just mentorship uh books i love podcasts yeah um yeah. you know i think yeah just there's so much out there now uh, yeah it sounds like yeah such a cool spot where you're in where you can you they they come to you you know what i mean like you're not having to always seek them out or hey can you can you pour into my life like yeah they are but they're naturally doing it and they're not um you just have that great resource right there all the time it's, yeah, that's really cool yeah so i make sure to to give it back you know that's kind of my mission with my uh people that i work with my coworkers. Mm. and my buddies that want to sit down with me and have meetings, it's so flattering, you know, I'm like, me, dude? I'm, yeah. You know, I'm You're a doctor, what the fuck do I have to yeah. tell you, you know? Yeah, but for sure. They, they, you know, it's it's cool. So it's, you know, I definitely want to give pearls of wisdom, but always, always, man, I'll always be just kind of a white belt mentality, mm -hmm. always learning. And Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, I had a couple, since I moved out here in June, I've had a couple meetings with people um, who are either getting their business started or wanting to get a business started and they're like, let's grab coffee. And, you know, it's always a privilege because I have the same reaction. I'm like, well, I'm still figuring it out myself. I, I'm not I'm not sure I'm going to help you. But then, you know, you, you learn their questions are from a standing of like, hey, I haven't got this thing going. I know you've done this for seven years, so you're going to help me out at some point, even though I know I'm still learning. You know, it's such an honor to know, you know, you can help somebody else, a younger uh, and a person who helped me out too, like way back in the day, you know. Well, it's funny when we met the other day, I almost felt bad so I'm like man I felt like I wanted to know more about yeah. you because you've been in your game longer so mm. I'm like oh god this guy's been oh wow so I wow. felt like god I hope he got enough out of me because I felt like I was asking a lot of questions and, oh man you know, no it's so. always it's such a it had so funny how sometimes it was just like a different perspective because I was like I, I'm just I'm just want to learn more about you you know so it's, it's always you know it's, I think that's a good way to look at it though too where you're just yeah you're not figuring you've already arrived you're just like Let's just keep moving together yeah. and help each other out. So, totally. last question: What kind of what's next? What's on the horizon? What do you have? What are you dreaming up? If you want to share, or maybe some general thoughts of what where you guys what you might be going. Um, man, there's just tons of options. Uh, I think having the the luxury of growing up in this town and and just you know being part of the community since you were a kid, and we have tons of barbers that grew up here as well. Hmm. Um, there's there's a lot of avenues and options we can go you know i i just think of shit all day you know mm -hmm. my barbers are visionaries <laughs> they think of stuff all day yeah i think right now what we're practicing is pumping our brake mm -hmm. and and we're just enjoying the sunshine mm -hmm. um we talk about so many things and our our practice right now is slowing down and, and enjoying and being present yeah um you know i got stuff lined up i want to get kind of out of the way so I can think more long term mm -hmm. and I think that'll free up some uh energy some some uh room to really sit down with the crew and it's important for me um to build with them uh so it, it'll be decisions we make together mm -hmm. so I don't know what it'll be 
Yeah. But there's a lot of a lot of ideas. We talked, you and I talked briefly when we first met about uh, the Enneagram. I don't know if you remember that. And I was saying, like, I was a seven, my wife's a six, and we kind of helped challenge yeah, each other. Yeah. And there's those nine numbers they go through. I don't know enough about it to really, really unpack it here, but I know that me as a seven, that's one of the things that I struggle with is just, like, putting my, like, looking down, like, sort of acknowledging where I am today because I'm always, like, on to the next thing. And it's harder for me to, like, be present and... You know, just be respectful of what I've got because it's yeah. always like I'm so quick to move on to the next adventure that I'm not uh, appreciative of what how I even got to this place. So right. it's cool to hear that because that's a that's a good reminder to me to okay. to acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's um, you know, I think uh, you you always appreciate it, but I don't know if you're like letting it emotionally sink in because mm-hmm. I I appreciate and I'm grateful and I say it every morning, but if I'm not careful, I'm like yeah 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 this is what we're doing now this is the next goal Mm -hmm. whereas you know again thanks to my wife julie she's pumping those Mm brakes and making sure like hey you enjoy where we're at it's cool we know you there's options Mm -hmm. um and then you know my job i think what i've just learned recently is is to relay that to the crew because we're all a bunch of excited visionaries that yeah like doing shit yeah for sure yeah Yeah, she's I've always we've kind of learned each other because I used to just assume she was not a risk taker and she was like pulling me back from the next adventure but to your point you know she was really causing me to sit and enjoy the moment and you know not always move on to the next thing and yeah there's some times when she probably pumped the brakes and and caused me to not move forward but at the same time there's so much stuff I would have ran after and would have run right after the, over right, the cliff, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And I needed that kind of experience or that input as well. So, so, so it's kind of hard for you to sit still. And... Yeah, for sure. It's um, to my, at least my mind for sure. It's always yeah. to your point. It's always like running with. I talked to so and so, and I wonder if we should do this, you know? And there's you know there's like the endless list of ideas of things to consider and then ideas to think about yeah. of the ideas to think about. Yeah, you know? totally, so, totally. So, and she's good at like, you know, just don't take on everything don't um you know you just can't do it all how do, how do we help prioritize and it sort of push some of the ideas off to the side and bring some other stuff here but always keeping me balanced in life too so i'm not like only running after work you know she's great yeah. at keeping the investment in family and fatherhood and and that sort of stuff which is good and um yeah keeps me balanced so what hopefully uh, i'm doing all right what uh what's like a practice you might do on your own because I'm like, my wife will tell me this and then it's my responsibility to channel that energy and harness and mm. calm it down. If yeah. You so personal practice to yeah, calm, to, yeah, to, to not run forward. stay in the moment, I guess. Yeah, I do try to, um, I've been doing this new exercise and we actually talked about it episodes ago on this podcast, but uh, I just started it this year of kind of just taking some moments in the morning to look, look in, literally look in the mirror and just sort of talk about things that I appreciate about myself because um I wasn't brought up with a philosophy of like self care or self love. It was, I was like, we love ourselves too much. So don't, Mm -hmm. don't, you don't need to do that. But I think like, you know, when you don't get a lot of affirmations growing up, you don't, you don't accept, you know, the good things you can add to the Mm -hmm. world. So I've been trying to do that. It's been a good like morning exercise for me to, um, affirm the things that I can, that I like about myself and things that I can add hopefully as a business owner, father, husband, all that kind of stuff. And helps me out at the beginning of the day to kind of, you know, then you get that shitty emails five minutes later and you're like, okay, it's not going to hit me as hard because right. I've just kind of like recentered myself versus what I tend to do is grab coffee and just get after it, you know, yeah. and then I'm not, not starting off in the right place. So <laughs> just, just derail the immediately. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then you get that one note and you're like, there goes my day, you know, and it's like That's 830. Good, That's cool. You say that, um, kind of that reestablishing that self-worth mm. you know that's what i've been working on too oh really yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know, you got affirm yourself every now and then and give yeah. yourself credit and no matter what you know i'm still good yeah you know, I don't, well i, I gotta hit that next goal to to validate who jason is mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and and it, my wife she uses this line from avet brothers of i'm gonna screw it up but i think it's you know i i wish you saw yourself as lovely as i see you so it's just you know really kind of again is like kind of hits me knocks me off my chair because it's if you don't see yourself in that way, you don't expect other people to see you in that in a, in a positive way. Cause yeah. if you feel like every, everybody sees you the way you see you and she's like, no, 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 I see you as way more special than you do. And I wish you saw yourself better. And, um, yeah, I imagine that our life, like our upbringings were kind of similar in some respects of just 
you know, family's kind of all over the place. My dad was working multiple jobs. Yeah, yeah they were together. They were married, but he still had kids from his first marriage he was taking care of. We'd see them every once in a while. Um, he was working constantly just to kind of pay for them and pay for us. And there wasn't a lot of time for, you know, sit down conversations and, yeah. you know, direct investment in, in totally. each other's lives. And that's definitely something I'm trying to like not repeat in, in my son's yeah. life, you know, try to be direct and say these, I appreciate this about you. I love this about you. Yeah. you know? totally. Um, but I imagine that's good for both of us to hear our, hear those things for ourselves. Oh right? yeah, absolutely, man. I think, um, kind of like you said, you, you know, what I'm learning is, uh, I think everyone kind of has that in the, and on, you know, I'm quoting what I've learned. I'm not the guy making this, uh, mm -hmm. the guru over here, <laughs> um, but our inner coach is, you know, typically not the, uh, add a boy coach, mm -hmm. you know, it's, oh, right, it's right, right, the, right. you know, the demeaning, the, uh, negative yeah. reinforcement coach so kind of learning that tidbit i would say you know maybe nine months ago and mm -hmm. and even checking that when i'm talking to myself like oh be a nice coach bro yeah, yeah that's cool that's you, a great... i'm nice to my kid i'm nice to my staff like be a nice coach to yourself too, yeah you know, so it's been slowly sinking in my wife reads a lot of Brene brown um yeah, stuff and she yeah, talks a lot about that she... came from yeah. yeah okay and sounded probably familiar from that and it, it just it sounded interesting, but then it's like taking time for me to like take hold of that. You know, it's like, oh, that's cool truth. Well, I'll get it eventually. Yeah, but then you start to, get to yeah, brain pathways. Yeah, yeah. To re yeah, exactly. Reform those paths that have been like set for for decades. You know, but totally. see, this is this is a counting session right now. This is me in your barber exactly. <laughs> shop right now yeah. without that without the haircut. But exactly. I feel like I'm getting a little session. In nice, so nice. <laughs> no, this is good. I'll definitely be in there one day. I have. A, it's funny. We've been out here since June, and that friend of mine who you know has got us. It's like I've been back to Indiana two or three times, and I just always have got it. Like, hey, give me another trim. Give me another trim. Yeah, so yeah. The, I've never been out here long enough to to warrant it, but I'm getting closer to that. So I'm gonna stop in just check it out because. I'm gonna just check out that culture and, and see how it is, man. Yeah, come in, say hi, man, whenever you're hanging out, coffee shop, whatever. Awesome. Um, we're like that, you know, we had our uh, guy that owns uh, the chiropractic studio down the hall. Okay. Came in today with his daughter before school and they just had some time to kill. Oh, wow. And they just came in to play checkers. That's awesome. You know? So, yeah. yeah, man, we welcome everybody to come hang out, say hi, we love it. That's such a cool culture, I mean, because you're, you're usually assuming, like, if I come in here, they got to put me on the books. So, you know, I'm taking up somebody else's spot, but yeah. just the sense of like, no, man, you can hang out here as long as you want. Right. Like, that's yeah, cool. you can hang out. You're not going to get an appointment probably if you walk in. <laughs> yeah, that might be a few days. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Week. But um, yeah, come in and say hi, man. We have we have guys that, you know, I can think of guys right now that get their hair cut and then they're doing the first part of their uh, their emails, whatever, mm. in the shop. You yeah. know, they're, they're staying there. That's their calm place. It's important for me to have the right energy. You know? mm -hmm. um, so it's it's such an honor when when people do that or stop in and just say oh it smells so good in here it yeah like being a kid you know? do you think I mean was that did that stand out to you about that space being in the school where you're kind of connected to those other entities around you the coffee shop and that kind of stuff what, did you see like this is going to work great for what I've been imagining or just what you described sort of yeah. that hallway traffic where people going almost from class to class you know totally absolutely um that that wasn't again it wasn't my plan to have a barbershop in this strong community oriented center mm -hmm. um i got lucky again um i did want to open it in the neighborhood it's at right now um roswell uh you know patty jewett mm -hmm. um because i lived there and yeah. it was you know more on our side of town where we're at it was just a little sleepy mm -hmm. so my thought was a standalone barbershop to get this little heartbeat going yeah uh, so when i got approached about the school and everyone that was on board it was a no-brainer so mm -hmm. that heartbeat just it, it's huge now it's way more than just one barber one mm -hmm. coffee shop that they all wanted to do this yeah now we're doing it as a bigger thing and it's this has been great for the community yeah i love that this whole scholastic environment that they've created there you know like um that i never saw that in indiana maybe they had i think they converted like schools into apartments and stuff like that but i never saw a you know business community out of that i just love um especially as an entrepreneur i can work in there and just meet other places and and you kind of do feel like a little kid back there and you're just going to the to the urinals and then you're heading back to, <laughs> to yeah. meet some other people down the hall to get totally. your class in or whatever yeah. so i love that environment that's super fun yeah well cool man thanks so much again for the time and uh we'll talk again soon yeah man thanks right. for having me brother later you've been listening to metaphorically speaking 
If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate us on iTunes and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. For more information and to check out our full library of entrepreneurial interviews, visit keyholemarketing.us. Also, feel free to send us an email anytime at hi at keyholemarketing.us. Thank you for listening. Thank you.